record, so we're good to go. And it's, I'm so excited to have Deidre here, uh, who's going to be talking to us about engaging families in STEM and what a fantastic time as school is getting started to have this conversation about what are activities that we can help support families in at home. Uh, and I'm so excited for all of the resources she's going to be sharing with us today. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Deidre, so it, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate being here with you and with everybody in the chat and everybody who's, uh, who's listening all over the at least Pacific Northwest, as far as I can see. It's absolutely awesome. So I'm Deidre Holmberg. I am the founder of a little company called STEM Core Consulting in Richland, Washington. Uh, some of you may know me from starting STEM schools and writing STEM curriculum and doing all sorts of STEM things all over uh, the Tri-Cities here in Washington. Um, yeah, so this has been a really fun little collab uh, with Jeff and uh, Reimagine Washington Ed. So I'm going to get right to it um, after I just give a shout out to all of the educators out there who are working super hard with the smoke, the distance, the COVID, et cetera. And just like to take a second to acknowledge um, all of the pain and suffering that's been going on out there. So if you're deeply impacted by fires, uh, COVID, et cetera, um, or you know, declining student enrollment, or just you know, problems with con connectivity, equity in your system. My heart goes out to you, um, and I'm just—I've been thinking a lot about you guys. I've been out in the field quite a bit the last couple of days, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of great things and a lot of hope out there. So uh, yeah, keep your chins up, and uh, please let me know if you need anything. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what is STEM. I won't take too much time uh, talking about this. Um, probably all of you know that uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but a lot of people don't really know how to access it. So instead of saying necessarily what it is, I like to talk about what it is more of and less of. So for example, um, right now I'm an adult talking. So we have a little saying in STEM, which the person talking is the person learning. So right now I'm learning the most, but when we get students talking about STEM, about problem solving, et cetera, um, that's really what we want kids to be doing. Now in an online format with distance learning, there are a lot of really cool and engaging ways that Reimagine Washington Ed has you know, put out there to the universe that I think could get students talking about STEM and that are, you know, fun, helpful, hopeful little activities uh, that get students doing a lot of the work. On a side note, I have a 16 year old son who's in his, I guess, you know, second week of school. And I hear him in the, the neighboring room talking very, very, very little with his teachers. Um, or with his classmates. So I would encourage anybody in a distance learning format or obviously in a live format to get students talking, get them out in breakout rooms, etc. Um, also too, um, inquiry in STEM is very, very important and student guided inquiry, which means students are making the decisions about what to learn. And if they're not making the decisions about what to learn, they're kind of making the decision how to learn. So when, I'm, when I think of, whenever I think of student guided inquiry is um, when I started a high school here in the Tri-Cities, we had a student guided inquiry called, where we basically gave students an opportunity to build a working light bulb with no instructions, no materials, no nothing. Like we're just going to give you a couple weeks guys and we need a working light bulb at the end. Now for students who are used to or were trained to sit and get that was a huge lift, like parents were raging, kids were crying, like we don't have any instructions, who the hell do you think you are? Um, but the bottom line is 100% of those students had a working light bulb um, at the due date, so it worked. So that student guided inquiry, very important. Another way to do that would be to give your students some sort of project at home um, that is kind of open-ended and have them come to you with a product or a prototype um, that they decide on. You know, in STEM, we like to integrate tons of connections in STEM. So if you're not like me and who's, I, I've been obsessively following STEM news since about 1978, because I'm a super nerd. Um, if you haven't been doing that, that's totally fine. Just go to the science and energy tab in CNN or, you know, just Google something. How can I make this hands-on for kids? 
Um, so and you wouldn't have to look too hard in the science, uh, the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards, to find kind of mega trends, right? So we're looking at you know climate change, pandemics, um, engineering disasters, anything that can connect students um, to learning with a vehicle that's like local, preferably, and that um, they can kind of latch on to. I'm thinking, you know, where we live in the Tri Cities. Uh, recently, there was a there's a, a fire raging right now um, outside of town, and it burned down railroad trellises all around uh, the city of Prosser, Washington. And so, like thinking about like showing those photos, they're quite shocking. And how can we, as engineers, as STEM STEMinists, um, how can we go back and um, you know learn about the integrated approach it's going to take to solve the problem of getting trains across that you know that valley now? So we like to keep it hands on. Um, so my son, God love him, is doing a lot of page 51 through, or like 51 number one through 21 odds, which I guess is okay. Um, but if we had a more hands-on approach to learning, that would be more STEM-centric. Um, also too, I mean, let's just rip the Band-Aid off on 21st century work. You know, even, even jobs, uh, for example, like working in agriculture, a lot of those jobs are automating. There's robots in the fields. We have um, a massive need for big data, for stack engineers, for computer scientists, for people involved in um, public health, uh, vaccines, biochemistry. I mean, there's so much emerging work out there and almost all of it is related to or directly in line with STEM. So if we wanna just teach English or just teach science, science, um, those days might be waning, right? We might have to really get down in the weeds with preparing our students for 21st century work. We need them to be capable, competent writers. We need them to be critical readers. We need them to understand and to be practiced in the science, mathematical, and engineering practices. Um, you know, all we now, I love this like change versus stability piece. So everything right now is uncertain. So let's, instead of looking at that uncertainty with fear, let's look at it with hope and with like, oh, I guess this is just how things are now. Things changing is how this is kind of going to be, like STEM always changes. That's why it's hard to buy STEM materials like shiny boxes from corporations that will serve students for seven to 10 years of a normal curriculum cycle. We wanna definitely like have materials that are updatable and when things happen like global pandemics or wildfires destroying you know all of the western united states we want to be able to incorporate that absolutely um, so student engagement in, in stem um, i've <laughs> I've been laughing at all of the funny Zoom antics I've heard about on TV or heard about uh, from my friends in the field who are engaging in Zoom calls. There might be some Zoom antics in this call, I don't know. But um, so student discipline, you know, of those Zoom antics uh, or Google Classroom antics, uh, if we engage students in hands-on work and, and um, those kinds of things, student engagement in, in STEM will decrease that um, that phenomenon. And then also that relevance and rigor. Um, one of the equity issues that I work on all of the time is um, making sure that students have equity in rigor, right? So we know if you look around at the data, at least in Washington State, we know that girls in fourth and fifth grade start to not lead in math, right? They start to kind of level off and then as they they age through middle school the math uh, with the boys and the math with the girls typically you know the the gap widens and widens and widens well if we don't get those girls back in sixth grade they're not going to probably be deeply involved in a stem career that's how critical that that rigor is and also too with computational thinking sounds really scary it's not uh, call me if you want to I'll, I'll do another one of these on computational thinking but just getting computational thinking into schools and showing students exactly why they're learning what they're learning is i think mission critical moving forward whether we're from a distance 
online or if we are uh, sitting in classrooms. You know, gone are the days where students just learn stuff to learn it. You know, now we have to use it and put it all together. Okay, so um, distance learning has certainly changed where we learn, but has it changed how we learn? And the answer is probably not. Um, you know, students learn best by teaching others, by bringing, um, like by using their hands, using their minds, and to be, to be mired in difficulty. So one of the things that I love about STEM is that it's desirable difficulty, right? So we want students to struggle a little bit. We want them to have to think outside the box. We want to push them as hard as we can from a distance, if that's how you're doing things. Um, to think, to solve problems, to engineer, to prototype, etc. So planning that difficulty and saying to parents when you're engaging them, hey, listen, this is going to be tough. Kids might not really like this, right? Because there aren't right answers when you necessarily, right? When you're prototyping, when you're engineering. You know, another thing to think about is learning to do all of this work in two or three separate ways. So, and kids are much more open to this than adults typically. So keeping in mind that, hey, if you did it this way in math or in engineering, can you show me another way to do it, right? So um, make them think, go screen light. Okay, so one of the fun little things that I'm hearing from the field is that parents are really tired of their kids looking at screens and it's only week two. <laughs> so, you know, sending them away from the screen or giving them um, non-screen homework to do or family engagement activities to do and have them bring it back to the screen and show what they did and provide evidence of learning um, is going to be a going to be huge, I think. Um, so getting them off the screens and into their garages, into their kitchens, into their backyards, um, to build some STEM scaffolds for themselves is going to be, I think, really exciting. And also too, here's the thing, like nobody knows how teachers are getting evaluated. Nobody knows like if the tests will be back. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity for us to be really creative with our time, right? We don't know if, we don't know what the heck's going to happen. So <laughs> this is a good time for, to get your STEM engagement uh, where it needs to be. And then also to think about this kind of integrated approach uh, for when we do come back to school. Okay, so I could not resist putting this picture in. Uh, this is my niece Fiona and her dad Scott. Um, Fiona is our is our family supervisor. She's uh, very very busy, always telling everybody what to do. And um, so engaging families in STEM. Now my niece and her twin brother are heavily engaged in gardening and yard work and um, repurposing uh, tree limbs to make birds nests and all sorts of crazy stuff. My brother in law pictured here is a first grade teacher, so that's certainly helps. Um, but basically when we engage our families in STEM, um, and if you're looking for a great rubric, there's um, this Flaboyan, uh, the Flaboyan Foundation has an awesome family engagement rubric that can kind of, you know, get you thinking about what you can do with uh, engaging families. It's just engaging families. Engaging families in STEM is just what I want to make sure that everyone is doing if possible. So we want to, if you do that, it means more of these things, right? It means more fun, it means more evidence of learning. It may not be a worksheet that you scan and send in, but it could be, you know, a picture that a student takes of something they've engineered. It's design, it's um, sharing ideas, it's touching base with those NGSS standards, your design, um, engineering design standards, et cetera. Communication. So you're going to have to communicate with your families that you want the whole family engaged. Now, some of you um, have families, probably all of you have families where the older siblings are the ones who are engaged in with the, the younger kids with distance learning. Parents are off to work. So when we talk about whole families, um, I'm talking about older siblings potentially um, taking the adult type role in these scenarios that I'll present to you. Um, so, or, you know, even just a bunch of kids K through six, you know, a little family that um, wants to do some hands-on learning together. So, um, but I'm going to show you some examples of really cool things that families have done to engineer, um, engineer fun, fun stuff. 
So time away from screens, huge, et cetera. So here's a little uh, thing for my friends at the NGSS at NSTA. So when we talk about integration of STEM and integration um, across the content areas, um, this is a little uh, graphic that I like to use. And um, the, the, pre the presentations I'm going to give to you today on, on specific activities that you can uh, work on are like the building, like E2, like the, gr the gray area in there. That's kind of where the STEM integration money lives, right? So constructing viable arguments, critiquing the reason reasoning of others, building a strong base of knowledge through content rich texts. Um, I'll, I'll present to you today, like just a bunch of stuff around um, specific books that I that lend themselves to um, to STEM and that are available online in English and Spanish for the most part. So definitely that gray area, the science, the math, and also too in that the area between science and math, you know, developing and using models is absolutely huge. Um, computational thinking, which is really pattern finding and looking at the abstraction behind simple things um, or developing algorithms for specific uh, processes or instructions, that's all those are. Um, I think that area too is where I think families can really, really engage. Okay, so here's my first, um, my first family engineering challenge. Um, so I'm calling this family engineering coronavirus pinata. So um, the books to the left are all books that um, they range in age from uh, kinder all the way up through the top end of middle school, even to high school. Um, so this is, so the books like The American Plague and Fever both center around the 1793 yellow fever pandemic in the United States uh, in Philadelphia. It, they also um, kind of honor the work of uh, Black Americans during um, during that pandemic who were looked at to be the primary caregivers to uh, the population of Philadelphia. So two great books, um, the American Plague would be for more upper middle school, Fever would be for let's say fifth and sixth grade. The Velveteen Rabbit, if you're not familiar with it, it's a classic. It's a very, very sad little book about a boy who gets very ill with scarlet fever and he, um, he his velveteen rabbit that is his number one pal has to be burned in a fire and but it becomes real so it's a fantasy story but it's also um it also starts to get students thinking about pandemics illness germs uh those types of things and then uh, a sick day for amos mcgee um, is just kind of a fun little book about what happens when we get sick and how we take care of each other. And I really like that book just because it's in English and Spanish. It has very rich vocabulary, beautiful um, illustrations, and it's, uh, it can be a really great kind of jumping off point for students to start talking about coronavirus, start talking about pandemics, etc. Um, so basically, this whole idea is that we're going to take um, what we learned, and we're going to uh, build piñatas. Now, piñatas are part of um, a Mexi Mexican folk, folk art, and so um, building these things, I think, is really fun. Um, you can also incorporate other pathogens. For example, Ebola is a great piñata. <laughs> the sentence has never been uttered in <laughs> history of science. Ebola is a great piñata. <laughs> But Ebola, um, hepatitis, um, any number of pathogens, specifically viruses, uh, rabies, great piñata, um, and make using this uh, Mexican folk art to make uh, piñatas or even mojigangas, which are gigantic masks and things like this could be really fun, nice art connection there. Um, and as a part of like social culture, you know, how do we protect ourselves and our families from germs? How do we go out? How do we um, look at this from a global perspective, but also like build something that we can have fun with that is in line with the designs or you can even bring in like so um, like electron micrographs of each uh, pathogen and then over on the bottom left of the screen there's a there's a, a coronavirus piñata that's already been made. So um, just a quick uh, quick way um, to get back into the science or this uh, this diagram. 
I love that the pinata piece has a strong base of knowledge through content rich texts that, and by the way, those texts for the most part um, for the older grades have a lot of history in them as well. So we're bringing in, you know, lots of writing, rich vocabulary, uh, not writing, reading, uh, rich vocabulary, and then we're working together as a family to build piñatas. Um, and then, you know, let's smash them when the vaccine comes out. Like, let's <laughs> let's go absolutely crazy. So we're developing and using models um, as well for that experiment, or that experiment, but that activity. So that's just one of the things I have going. Um, and I have a, a community in uh, the desert that's using this already, and the parents have decided to have uh, pandemic piñata competitions. So it's getting pretty crazy out there. So anyway, um, any questions or comments about this in the chat? I see we have like 11, think about the possibilities of engaged student in real world. Okay. Any questions from you guys? I don't know that I can see everything. I see the chat. So if you have questions about this, uh, please throw it in the chat. If not, I'll just keep on trucking. Okay. So this is where it gets kind of technical. I'm not seeing, I love it, good way to access the moment. All right, so uh, let me look at this here. This is supposed to be a video, but I'll explain to you what it means. And it, I think uh, the slides, the video is, uh, the video works. I don't know why it's not working here, but whatever. Okay, so the next thing I'll show you is the Family Engineering Sumpango Kite Challenge. So in Sumpango, Guatemala, every day of the dead, there is a family engineering kite competition where these absolutely massive kites are, um, are built by family members, right? So um, they have, you know, people of all ages, families, uh, community groups, and they put on this absolutely massive um, kite festival and it's it's cultural and that it uh, is supposed to ward off uh, evil spirits from uh, the day of the dead visitations from uh, you know lost loved ones etc and so what I would have students do is look at the video that's in your slides and look and see the beautiful colorful um, incredible kites that the, this community builds every year and has been building them for about 300 years. The little guys in uh, Sampango, Guatemala, they build children's kites, small little kites. Um, and if you want, I could send you, um, I could send you the, the plans for those. Basically, engaging students in kite engineering. Now also too, um, I've done this with a couple of communities. Students don't know how to fly kites, like even ones that are commercially made. So getting students like in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, um, to figure out how to fly a kite, that's a STEM activity. It's kinesthetic, it's hands-on, have them, you know, you know, find commercial kites. They're very inexpensive. Um, and you can even hand them out to students, but many of them probably have one around or can get one. So having them fly a commercially made kite would be kind of the first step here, getting parents to think about it. And then as we build Sumpango kites, um, we can learn about forces in motion, concepts of lift, how airplanes work, how birds fly, um, how weather impacts where and when we fly kites, airflow, and of course, folk art. Um, many of the kites from Sampango tell a story as well. Um, so I've had kites come in that, uh, you know, showed off Power Rangers, showed off uh, recycled materials. So some students may not have access to things like tissue paper, but they probably have access to candy wrappers. So I saw, I've seen so many cool kites come through the door. Um, one of them was made out of dum-dum wrappers that had been um, kind of taped together and flew really well. Um, butcher paper obviously would work, et cetera. So, um, and here's some literature. So again, I love the, all of this literature. It all comes in English and Spanish. Um, the children's literature, so the Curious George Flies a Kite and also Stuck um, are in bilingual read-alouds online. Um, it, the, really cool. And then for your middle school and high school students, the Kite Runner, which basically details the making and the flying of kites in Afghanistan, which is a very common um, activity in all sorts of parts of the world. So, um, and it really honors the work of uh, communities like in the Gaza Strip, 
um, in, in Afghanistan, uh, big kite makers in Indonesia as well. Um, but this, the Kite Runner is a story about Afghanistan and about competitive kite flying, where they basically shoot down each other's kites by cutting the lines between the kites. It's a really cool thing to do. Not that I want kids to be doing that in your communities, but it would be cool, I think, to have families make kites and then uh, for Day of the Dead or for Halloween, um, fly those kites in their yards. So you could have a little, you know, socially distant kite festival. So they have to plan a, and conduct an investigation. They have to basically build a model, et cetera. So, you know, I, I just love this one. I've done this. My uh, kite festivals have ended up in the Johns Hopkins, you know, publication. Um, glass shards on the kite lines. Yes, Brett, Brent Cummings. Uh, we don't want to have that, like I said. <laughs> People be like, STEM, we engaged our families in your STEM ideas, Deidre, and three of them went to the hospital. <laughs> so no, no glass shards on the kite uh, strings and no, uh, you know, they can tangle the, the kite lines, but that's about it. I love it. So yeah, go, getting back to um, building that strong base of knowledge through rich text. There's tons of stuff out there um, about kites and also about the uh, cultural importance of them um, in, you know, like I said, Guatemala, parts of Central America, parts of Mexico, uh, Bali, Indonesia, all sorts of places. So really cool stuff. So use your, um, develop that model and try it out. Also too, if you're going to engage your families in kite building, have them for sure take pictures of the kites and have videos uh, made of students flying them. And then um, also warn your families that when the kite breaks, because usually handmade kites don't last all that long, that there should be level um, by taking it back to the drawing board, right? We don't ever hardly ask our kids to persevere in solving problems, especially problems that they themselves caused with a crash or some sort of thing. So getting them back to the drawing board, making a place for the kite to, to be rehabbed um, would be absolutely huge. And again, the kites are, so pandemic piñatas are underway in a, a school district in uh, north of here. And then they just got this kite unit that I wrote and they are, the families are in uh, stiff competition with each other's, with each other. Getting them back to the drawing board. Love this mantra for learning. Thank you, Tricia. I can't get enough of it. So the idea here is that when you break your stuff, you can put it back together again, you can fix it, you can tinker with it. Um, and also too, there might be some materials change outs, like for students who are using tissue paper, they might, you know, go fly their kite and, you know, Beverly Dunes and it just gets ripped to shreds. <laughs> So they might want to think about other materials that they would use that would strengthen their kites and make them more likely to fly. So they might be changing out materials, fixing things that are broken. Um, so it's not just a one-time project. This is an ongoing thing of prototyping and then fixing, troubleshooting, etc. And those are really the science and engineering practices we want kids to be working on. Uh, love it. This is how we spend the majority of our time in our drones program. Oh, love me some drones. And here's why. Drones are so like, especially for high school students in terms of thinking about um, the ethics around drone strikes and also the engineering that goes into these things is absolutely incredible. Uh, I'm talking about military drones and uh, that kind of thing. But then again, also too, privacy issues, you bring all your social studies in there. Um, and then also just learning how to fly a drone. And then there's federal, um, federal drone programs or unmanned uh, flight rules that you can get a little certification in. So um, that's something that could be explored as well. Also, there's DIY drones as well. You can build your own drones. I don't know if you do that, Brent, but um, drones are really cool and they're very, very controversial. I have a unit that I'm brewing in my head called uh, Math is Murder, <laughs> which weirdly nobody wants to buy yet. 
uh, but it's about trajectories and parabolas as related to um, projectiles, some of them coming from drones. So if you're an 11th grade or 12th grade uh, math teacher, algebra two or plus, call me. Okay. The next uh, one that I wanted to talk to you about is a little uh, a little unit I've put together that I think would be great. Um, this picture, which is actually a video, so please go and enjoy the enjoy the video as well, is this little bird is a cuckoo bird and it was laid into a warbler's nest. So that means um, the cuckoo bird went and laid an egg in somebody else's nest to get uh, the parents of the actual birds or the, you know, the, the baby birds um, to take care of their baby for them. So this is an example of a brood parasite, which is, so this little guy right here pictured will push all of the other eggs out of the nests into the water. And then this bird will actually grow up very, very fast with the parents that are not there in the same species of bird, feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. And it actually gets so big so fast and it looks absolutely nothing like uh, the host parents um, that it actually will fall out of the nest. It gets so large, but here are these little birds rocking it and um, trying to feed this hungry baby that they looks unfamiliar, but they keep doing it. So that's an example of brood parasitism. So some of you may be familiar with my friend Stella Luna. So, um, and I did this kind of, I presented Stella Luna as a brood parasite before and people were like, I've never read Stella Luna. I'm like, well, you have not lived, my friend. Um, so Stella Luna is basically the story of a bat who um, gets separated from her mother and falls into a bird's nest. The mama bird makes Stella Luna sit in the nest and not hang upside down, makes her eat bugs instead of fruit. And the big question I would ask of parents reading this book and the other ones like it. So what's eating you? Great little book about parasites. There are online read alouds. And then there's a fiction book series that I, I chose to kind of go with this for the older kids as well uh, called Silver Wing. Um, Silver Wing is the, the main character. It's a bat. Um, and I thought, I just thought it would go well together, but this is almost like a book pairing, a multi-age book pairing for family engineering. So what's eating you all about parasites in general, and you could bring in some coronavirus or viruses into the mix if you wanted to, but Stella Luna, big question is, is Stella Luna one of the most loved characters in children's literature? Is she in fact a brood parasite? And then also too with Stella Luna at the end of the book, I don't want to spoil it for any of you, she learns to, or she figures out that she can echolocate. So there's standards for first grade all over this thing. Um, but then what we will teach or have students do is we are definitely going to um, have the families either prototype or fully build or build prototype and then build um, all sorts of like a, a bird house or a bat house that they would put in their yard. Um, around here in Washington, we have lots of native bats and many of them do need homes. Although bats are kind of on the no fly list right now because of COVID-19 people are like, I don't wanna learn about bats right now. Uh, but I think it's a good little project. I think I can I can see older siblings and parents uh, taking this to the next level and really getting after it. So um, very popular book. Many parents have it already. It's in online um, read alouds in English and Spanish already. I'm not sure about what's eating you. I wasn't able to find a read aloud in Spanish, but uh, for the younger kids, Stella Luna is right there and you could totally use it and be super fun. Also too, one of the things before we get to prototyping that we want them to be developing a simple sketch or a little physical model if they can, kind of write it out, maybe even measure it out on paper first, make a plan um, and really get them into some sort of like drafting situation. So thoughts on Stella Luna being a parasite, is everybody okay with that? 
for those of you that have read Stella Luna, I get nervous because, you know, she is like the most important character in children's literature, to, according to some. All right. Uh, Ms. Oh, STEM mystery novels, Talk to Me and Time Tilter. Okay. Love that. I'll have to check those out. I haven't read those yet. I've been reading uh, children's books like A Lunatic for the past year. So, um, yeah. I'll, I'll add that to my list. Okay, so I kind of talked about this a little bit um, already. Again, we're developing using models. Um, we're looking at that strong base of knowledge through content-rich text. I mean, Stella Luna is a beautifully illustrated, beautifully written book with lots of rich text in it. Um, and the Spanish version sounds even more beautiful when it's read aloud. So you can quick find those on the internet and put a link into your Zoom classrooms, your Google classrooms, uh, your Canvas, etc. So students can have access to that rich text. Or you can, if you have it handy, you can make a video yourself. And if your students hear it from you, I think that's way better. But you know, you have options, people, you have options. Um, also too, with regard to math and building houses, bird houses and bat houses, that attention to precision is absolutely critical. Um, you want the house to last, you want it to be nice. Um, and it's one of those things where we definitely want to do some measuring, we want to do some cutting, we want to get it out there, people. So yeah. Do what you need to do. Okay, so this is a video. I if, when you get the chance, watch the video. So the <laughs> okay, this is and by the way, this is an important video because it is the only video that I've been able to find that showed a hailstorm without the F word in it. Okay, so <laughs> so if you want to show hailstorm videos or any sort of extreme weather first person point of view videos, do your due diligence and find ones that don't have the F word in it. Um, also the S word, big popular one for extreme weather, especially on YouTube. So this one is about a beach in Siberia. It was 40 degrees Celsius that day, huge beach, amazing. Everybody's in the water, having fun, typical beach day. And then uh, a hellfire of hail starts to rain down on this beach. Uh, people were badly bruised. They're running off, running in all directions. And so um, this video is, if there are swear words, they're in Russian. So just be careful. It is translated, but there are some beeps. Um, anyway, so a thought like a video like this where you show a massive uh, weather event. By the way, we have massive weather events happening right here in Washington and all over the Northwest right now. So you don't have to use this hailstorm video, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, and so the Family Engineering Challenge, a couple of them here, um, is building a barometer uh, out of like a jar and a balloon and, you know, a couple little things, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, and then also a prototype foldable hail shelter or umbrella, which very difficult to make in terms of an umbrella, but a foldable hail shelter can be made out of, um, out of recycled materials very easily. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, love that. Obviously, that's a fantasy book where, you know, every three times a day, it rains food from the sky. So I'm using the, the connection of like meatballs with hail. And so actually, Cloudy with a Chance of Hail would be where we would go next with this. But also for your older learners, um, especially eighth and ninth graders, I, well, the I Survive series you can do with fourth, maybe even third third to sixth graders, and then the science of weather and climate um, has a real emphasis on climate change as well, would be for your ninth and 10th graders, eighth, ninth, and 10th graders. Um, obviously, climate change, hail storms, extreme weather is all related, and bringing in uh, fun, not fun, but bringing in our climate, you know, school strike for climate, uh, would be an interesting kind of ethical dilemma for kids. Like, is it okay to not go to school if you're striking for climate? Like, I know we don't want to give them any funny ideas around, you know, attendance right now, but I think it's worth having the conversation that 
you know, is climate important enough for us to strike or to um, to be become advocates, become uh, active in in politics and things like this. And a lot of people like to get away from politics. I like to kind of run toward politics. Um, because honestly, what does the data say about climate change? It's extremely clear. Um, and so the STEM concepts here would be obviously extreme weather. There's plenty of relevant examples right on our doorsteps, unfortunately. Um, climate change, pressure, temperature, barometer, building your own barometers is mercifully simple. And then data collection would be what I would be really interested in students see, doing over time. So having a little homemade barometer at home, students can take data every day. Um, and then, of course, they can prototype and improve their model um, for their um, for their hail, hail shelter. Uh, just you know, we talked a little bit about this again. Um, we're attending to precision. We are developing using models. We are constructing viable arguments and critiquing others. We're doing all sorts of things, and hopefully, students will be talking to each other, um, and will just be really mindful about students and families having conversations and then having them in um, in the classrooms as well. Okay, so Bug Hotel, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but um, I, I'm a big, big gardener. I love my bugs. And so a couple of important family engineering uh, challenges that we can do here. Uh, first of all, the Grouchy Ladybug by Eric Carl in love. Um, it's in English and Spanish. There's read alouds online. Uh, and then I'm super jazzed about uh, the novel, The Murmur for, of Bees, um, which is just a powerful uh, novel um, that's recently been translated into English that I absolutely love that I think could work for, um, and it's fiction, but uh, work for your middle school girls in particular. Um, and those kinds of things. And then The Wisdom of Bees and also Honeybee Democracy are great books uh, that talk about leadership, efficiency, problem solving, decision making, etc. that bees do all of the time. Uh, also, fun fact, kids love learning about mistakes in science. So big mistake happened in Brazil in 1956. Uh, you know, somebody let the cat out of the proverbial bag by letting Africanized bees into uh, loose in South America, in Brazil. Um, they've made it in these uh, decades up to about the you know, middle of the United States. So now uh, bees are more aggressive. Uh, their genetics have been mixed with Africanized bees. Um, and then also there's some very serious problems with bees right now, like the Varroa mite. So learning about uh, colony collapse, uh, the importance of bees as pollinators, learning about robotic pollinators that are being worked at right here in the, like the major or Tri-Cities area at WCU. WCU, IREC, and Prosser, they're working on robotic pollinators, so in, to replace bees, which is it's kind of a sad day, but yeah, get it done. Build yourself one of these guys. Bug mo Hotel, they can be as big as you want, made out of recycled materials. Um, you can use recycled plastic, recycled yard waste, you name it. Build yourselves a bug motel or hotel and put it in your yard. Um, you can also build a mason bee um, place for them to live. We do have mason bees in this part of Washington and, and a lot of the parts that I saw you guys are from. Oh, thanks, Alyssa. Alyssa and I went to Principal College together. All right, so um, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I, Bug Hotel, wonder if it would go on for me, Airbnb. Yeah, so I'm gonna answer any questions and I'm also gonna put some stuff in the chat as well. Um, I'm gonna throw, let me see if I can put it in there. I don't know if I can add stuff to the chat, but um, Jeff, I, I sent to you a list of children's books. Yep, I already shared that, shared oh, that perfect. just a second ago. So, okay, and I was just getting ready to share uh, if you want to talk a little bit about it. Um, if you want to talk about the children's book, I already shared that. If you want okay, to talk perfect. about that real quick. Yeah, I do. So the children's book list that I gave you guys are for uh, basically primary learners. 
and their common children's books, almost all of them are in online read aloud so they can be embedded into your distance learning plans for the day. Um, and they are they have stem connections. Some of them are pretty strong, in my opinion, uh, but others of them might take a bit of a bit of research on your part. Um, so, you know, one of my favorites, by the way, um, there's a book children's book called Where is the Green Sheep? And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, I hadn't seen them. There's a little nudibranch, a little, it's called a sea sheep or CU. And it's basically, it looks like a cartoon sheep and it's a living creature that's photosynthetic and it's green. So um, when we take uh, the book, Where is the Green Sheep? We wanna definitely bring in some of those images as well and make it a STEM book. I don't think many of those books were written as STEM books, but there can be some nice connections moving forward um, made with those books with online read alouds that are already embedded, super fun. And then I also included a grocery list. Um, I don't know if you put that up there yet. Oh, perfect. And uh, the grocery list has in it a number of really cool um, and extremely common things that can be used for, um, used for science experiments uh, around the house. Also, I think it's, uh, I've put, included, I think three links at the bottom of that. And it was, uh, it, they are really, um, whatchamacallit, like they're just really succinct, kind of embeddable uh, activities that you can just kind of goof around in there and figure out what you want to do. Uh, lots of modeling and doing the experiments first, if you want to check that out as well. Um, so we have a, a question in the chat, which is, if you were going to recommend STEM on a sho shoestring kit, uh, what might you be able to recommend families to try to source, put together? What five things would you most want to see in that kit? Oh, such a good question. Okay. I would definitely put, I don't have to count water probably, um, probably measuring tools like measuring cups um, and then also maybe a little scale, um, a magnifying glass and a lot of natural like out in the world nature ob observations I think would be great. I also love, you know, your basic spices or not spices, but your basic, uh, you know, things like flour, sugar, um, and eggs. Eggs are great for teaching diffusion. <laughs> I, I love, love me some eggs. Also too, um, I love hydrogen peroxide. And for those of you that don't know this and aren't weird STEM people, um, hydrogen peroxide, you guys know when you put it on cuts, it bubbles. Uh, but that's an enzyme re enzymatic reaction. So, uh, so there's an enzyme in living things called catalase and it breaks down hydrogen peroxide. And so you, lots of things have catalase in them. So you can, you know, try it out on fresh meat. You can try it out on cooked meat. You can try it out on, um, on carrots and apples and fruits and vegetables. Just pour some, you know, hydrogen peroxide on it, chop them all up and pour some hydrogen peroxide on it. Love me some hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> <laughs> like that. That's awesome. Uh, there's another resource here you had that was the uh, 2020 National Day. Uh, oh, yes. National History yes. Day. Yeah. So, um, oh, forgot to mention this. National History Day is um, a really fun and engaging set of projects for students. And so um, it incorporates all of the things we talked about today. So the math, science, the literature, and students have the option of, of writing a paper, building a, a website, uh, making a documentary. Um, and they just have all these great ways to have them express what they want to learn. So it's, you don't have to like pay the 80 bucks or whatever fee. If you just had students work on the 2020 theme, which is breakthroughs in history, I put in, I just went absolutely crazy and listed 5,000 people or 5,000 projects that were breakthroughs in science that I think kids could learn a lot from right now. Even like Dr. Fauci with his uh, Ebola breakthrough or, or Dr. Fauci with his AIDS and HIV breakthroughs that he made as an epidemiologist over time. Um, but I listed, I don't know how many are there, probably 30 different projects that students could choose from that they could kind of go off on their own inquiry um, and develop a product that, you know, like a diagram or not a diagram, but a, um, an exhibit where they could show everything that they've learned over time. I've seen students do things that are so crazy. One of my students uh, did 
a thing on the death penalty and interviewed judges in Washington state um, all about their death penalty cases and capital cases that they had. Absolutely fascinating. So National History Day, again, um, is just a, a, a platform from which students can go and do self-guided inquiry. And the, the theme this year is so great, breakthroughs in history. And if you just think of it as breakthroughs in STEM that happened in history, then you can just start generating your own ideas yeah. too. One of the things I was talking about with some teachers the other day actually was this idea of, and maybe it's because I was a fourth grade teacher, but this idea that we, you know, we study the explorers of the old age. Are we studying, studying the explorers today? You know, whether it be yeah. astronauts on the International Space Station or explorers yeah. in the ocean, like there are explorers who are exploring our world. Yes. So, and where do you bring in that historical perspective of, I mean, very much like Magellan and Christopher Columbus and everybody yeah. else back then were explorers, you know, who were out finding things out. We are still doing that today. And where do we bring that in? as well yeah. and, and and a lot of that ties it right back into this idea of stem and getting kids interested oh, in the world absolutely. around us you know? and you know i love underwater exploration um there's tons of videos out there and beautiful photographic evidence of what goes on down below um also too you have you know all of the space probes that are doing intergalactic travel i mean absolutely fascinating stuff breaking the helispheric barrier yeah. um so many great things going on. And also to think about how those, how those, um, those rovers are controlled from earth is truly fascinating. Yeah. Um, and when we think about, you know, remote control of anything, um, you know, how does that work? What are the waves involved? Um, what is the engineering that has to go into, you know, planned, planned obsolescence of these things that are out in space? Yeah. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm not a space person, but once I started getting into this kind of work, I really started um, marveling at the engineering and the problem solving that's taking place. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, who are some of your favorite STEM people to follow online? Oh, well, I mean, that's a long list. So Bozeman Science uh, is one of my favorite NGSS uh, guys. He's an absolutely uh, amazing science teacher, and he puts out all sorts of videos that help explain the standards to students. I love uh, the ambitious uh, science teaching uh, book uh, that comes out of UW out of STEM tools. I really like those guys. Um, and I really like uh, the website that was at the bottom of the grocery list called Sciencing. And so that's K-12 Science uh, Outlook. Um, and you can, you know, there's some really, really rigorous stuff in there and there's some super easy stuff that, you know, anyone can do. Um, so those are my three top ones. And then of course, you know, I love NASA. Can't get enough of that. I know they've got a great website, don't they? They've got, and they've got Incredible. some many great, uh, STEM activities that are already there. Just something I am that I've had, I've been talking about teachers here the last couple of weeks as schools getting started is, you know, usually when school starts, we create a, uh, back to school list of supplies that kids should bring. And sure. I'm thinking what we need to be thinking about also right now is what is your at home learning supplies? supply list. Yeah. And the things that I think are really easy, uh, again, regardless of your social economic status is cardboard. Yeah. Uh, you can do so much with cardboard. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and with most people buying things now on Amazon and going to places, you, cardboard is usually something you have a, a lot of, and whether yeah. that's paper towel tubes, uh, duct tape, or even the still glue yeah. sticks, like you can oh, do yeah. so much with a lot of that. Um, yeah. But I, I've had a couple teachers, I threw this out there in one of my trainings not that long ago about what if one of your first activities with your kids is to make your physical background not a not a virtual background but use yep. cardboard and much like you have your virtual background on right yeah. but but if you have a chromebook virtual backgrounds don't work or if you're in google meets they don't right. work but kids can make their own physical yeah. background out of some you know cardboard and sticky notes and whatever else you got sitting around the house and you got to figure out how you get it to stand up behind you and make sure it's yeah. big enough to fill in the screen and yeah and to solve a lot of problems with engineering and prototyping like that's yeah. really just prototyping right so yeah you know, and using what you have you know i don't I, there's so many stories in stem about people who just used what they had right so we're not i mean i'm not a fan of going out and buying shiny stuff from and from stem people necessarily but um, use what you have, solve the problems that are in front of you, um, you know, do something that's creative and that's engineering, um, design yeah. something with your family, uh, come together to put something together. Um, and that's kind of, 
you know, when we engage families in STEM, that's the work of the whole family. It's not just the, you know, the teacher or the individual student. When we're building kites, that's a family affair. That's not easy to do, right? So when, um, you know, the bird houses and the bat houses, you know, there's a lot of work in engineering that goes into those. And if you don't have any wood, I'm positive you've got cardboard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just shared in the chat too, one of my favorite videos to get kids to be thinking about uh, some of this. And again, I'm trying to think of, you know, for many of us, we're, we're in this at distance learning. Uh, but this is one of my favorite videos to show kids. It's a Rue Goldberg machine oh, that, yeah. uh, that Artie, Arnie put together. He's a fantastic, he's, I think he's a fourth grader. Um, but what I love about it, to your point is, is he makes this machine at his house with like things, people like a toaster and a power strip. And he's got a toilet paper tube and he's got actually a roll of toilet paper and he's yeah. got a wine glass and a colander and, yeah. and he ca he ca he captures one of his one of his toys but the thing i love the most about the the video is if you want to watch it it's such a great video is whoever his mom or dad at home who are helping him they make him hypothesize how many times does he think it's going to be right versus you know how many times does he have to try right. and he thinks he's going to fail 20 times and only have it work twice and i'm like what a great mindset that you're going into this knowing that you're going to fail that many yeah. times and yeah. then it works for the first time after it only fails a couple times and then he just goes ballistic and just to watch this kid be like oh my gosh it works it actually works you know i thought yeah, was and, pretty, pretty and that cool. moment where that student yeah, is like so good acknowledging that they did something really special and made something unique into the engineering themselves that moment is addictive to teachers so one of the questions in the chat is what are some tips for adults with little STEM experience? Yeah. Well, how about modeling the fact that we designed something and it didn't work? Or how yeah. about showing or learning like as you're teaching, right? So it's okay to not know everything about STEM in order for you to just try it, yeah. right? Show the kids, if you give them an engineering activity or you give them the kite challenge or whatever, make a kite yourself and tell them what happened. Tell them you wrecked it the first time you flew it, but you got it flying. And yeah. then um, common mistakes educators make when approaching STEM is that they think it's unattainable, right? They think that this, it's some sort of magic sauce that STEM people have when really STEM is very, very approachable if you approach it as a learner yourself, right? Like you don't need to be perfect to or have your stuff work the first time. And in fact, if you model that for students, it'll be a powerful role modeling experience for them. Yeah. Right. Because sometimes with the stuff we put together is garbage, right? But yeah. <laughs> so you got to roll with it. Well, and I love this question too. And I think this plays right off it, right? Is what was what what would be the one of the most common mistakes that educators make when approaching STEM? Mm -hmm. I think one of the most common mistakes, and it's not just STEM, I think in learning in general, is we over we over organize the entire learning process for kids you know there's a difference between organizing the learning process and structuring the learning process our job is to structure the learning process but you don't organize it for kids that's where the learning takes place and right. i think what happens but that means you have to let go of this of the c word right control you got to let go of control because kids need to control the the entire process of learning that is what makes this and it is it's frustrating and it struggles and it doesn't work the first time and kids cry like, yeah and kids cry and it's okay right it's okay yeah, teachers cry so, yeah yeah so yeah so that that whole thing that. where you know we ask kids to not sit and get we ask them to create we ask them to get out of their chairs and go outside do something um, it's hard, right? Because we want to control it. We already feel so uncertain and uncontrolled right now, right? So a little bit of control on that Zoom call or a little bit of control in that Google meetup, it feels better to us. But yeah. what it doesn't really do is force students to be mired in rigor and difficulty in the science and engineering practices, right? Yes, so, so true. And it's so how do we excite kids with STEM and future careers when the tech supplies we are decades old? I, great question. One of the things that I've done that has worked um, with getting kids excited about STEM is our computer and electronics dissections. Um, that, you know, if you have extra electronics laying around the house, have kids take them apart. Um, also learning, I think kids are really motivated by money. <laughs> Some of them, yeah. like they just really want to be rich. So talking about, hey, if you have this set of dispositions and this set of skills, you can make this kind of money. Also showing them, they have to see it in order to be it, 
show them somebody who did the work, who comes from your area. I was looking into Ellen Ochoa the other day, um, you know, and she grew up partially in Sunnyside, you know, so she's a, an astronaut with NASA. She was on the space station. She was the director of NASA for, you know, a long time. Um, show somebody, show people out there in the field who are doing the heavy lifting and came from the same place. Um, and then also, too, giving them an opportunity to have that moment that you talked about, Jeff, with the Rube Goldberg device. The way to yeah. get them interested in STEM is to provide them the freedom and the opportunity to have that, oh, my God, it worked moment. Yeah. Right? Or, oh, my gosh, you got to do this again. Yeah, <laughs> so I, true. But just, motiv just be motivated to, to prototype, to fix, to troubleshoot. If they can prototype, fix, and troubleshoot well, what can't they do in STEM? Yeah. And I think one of my favorite things right now, you know, we've been talking a lot about how do you take the opportunity that has been presented to us and for better or for worse, you know how Zoom works or you know yeah. how Google Meet works. You can get a scientist, a mathematician, somebody who is working on a pollinating machine right here in the Tri-Cities to yeah. come talk to your kids and you don't have to pay them anything. There's no. no travel cost involved. You send them a link and all of a sudden you can engage kids by people who are doing real work in the, you yeah. know, in these, in these places. I mean, the technology yeah. is here for us to connect kids. Yeah. And finally, then, by the way, yeah. you know, and, we couldn't always get Skype in the classroom and things like yeah. that. Now we have this opportunity to literally open the entire world to kids with those, uh, those people in the careers that we want to promote, right? Who are, and yeah, by the yeah. way, you can't just pick anybody. You have to have somebody who's engaging, who is anxious to talk to kids about what they do, who might even be able to show them around the lab, show them their colleagues, et cetera. So um, I've found quite a few people out there who are willing to help and, um, and they're great with kids of all ages. Um, so... I love this question and I just, I'd love to hear if you've got anything, but yeah. uh, there, one of the questions is wondering if you have any great STEM challenges for teachers to try out together, like a STEM, like team building activity, I think would be so cool. Oh yeah. No, I have a million of them. Um, what oh, I have two that are in particular that I think, I don't know that they would take a short amount of time. One is called uh, landfill harmonic engineering where teachers basically uh, take garbage and make musical instruments, right? I love so, it. and it's all based on Landfill Harmonic, the feature length film about uh, a community orchestra made out of garbage in Paraguay. So, they, they're world famous, they go on world tours, et cetera. So, it's based in reality, very touching story. Another one that I really like uh, that I've done with teachers is uh, I, called it, I call it Project Fun Way where they have to basically build clothing or build an outfit out of recycled materials, plarn, um, and basically make something, design something that's fashion forward, um, is wearable, and is made out of all recycled materials. And so, I mean, it's sort of like the avant-garde challenge on Project Runway. Um, but those are two that I've done. I've also done the kites with teachers, and uh, it takes quite a bit of time, but it's really, really sweet to watch the teachers try to fly them. I wish I could record I love that. what they are saying when they're out there trying to fly them. Um, and some of them are completely ridiculous um, and obviously, you know, are not going to do all that well in flight, but they're beautiful. Teachers worked hard on them. They collaborated, they prototyped, they designed it, and then now they're trying to fly it. So um, kids and teachers, adults alike, will be very excited by these things. I love that. Uh, a couple other questions. I just so good. Thank you for the questions over in the Q and A. It's so great that you're putting these here. It makes it uh, nice and easy for us to answer them. Uh, what are some tips you have for teachers who want to engage in STEM uh, projects from a sustainability lens? Like, are there some that are very sustainability focused or someplace for someone yeah, to start? I mean, anything that I'm talking about can be made and engineered out of recycled materials. And I think really talking to students about, like we all, we all say like reduce, reuse, recycle. We don't really reduce, right? We don't really reuse. So, um, so true. So how do we get, how do we kind of put a toehold in there with reduction and reuse of objects and things that we have around. So that's from a sustainability sense, I think that's one way to go with it. 
Another way would be like looking at what's going on right now with fire, right? How do we mm. sustainably manage a resource like our forests or our, you know, open, you know, bureau land management places, uh, et cetera. But how do we like even use native ways of knowing to manage our forests sustainably? How do we burn intentionally? How do we remove brush, et cetera? Um, those are the kinds of things making it really, really relevant and probably something you can see on the news right now would be really important. Um, those are just some ideas that I have, but I mean, there's a million ways to do it um, mm. that I think are, are really cool. I love that. Thank you. Um, okay. I already answered, we already answered that one. Yeah. Um, Uh, I'm trying to see here, but we got a couple more. I just want to see which ones I'm going to do. We got the shoestring budget one. I love that one. Yeah. Well, oh, this is an interesting one. What are, what are the middle school and high school STEM activities or problem-based, project-based uh, uh, learning that you have found to be successful in re-engaging young people who have been dis, uh, disfected with math and science by, uh, by our educational system? older youth focus on relevant uh, to them? So super great question. And one, the thing that I've done that's been the most successful, some of the things I've done have not been particularly successful, but the one thing that has been successful over and over and over again and is replicable is looking at your community colleges and figuring out what types of programs they have. For example, uh, where I live, we have Columbia Basin College where they have a massive agriculture um, platform, they have auto mechanics, they have all sorts of kind of stackable credentials uh, in healthcare um, and anything. And so kind of orienting your students in that kind of disaffected group toward what's available right there in their community at their community college and really you know, introducing them, bringing them on those college visits uh, immersing them in the work of ag science, if that's what they're interested in, or computers, whatever it is they're interested in, find it in a reasonable distance from your student and immerse them in it. Um, and also relationships are super important for those guys as well. Having you know students who come from the same high school who are engaged in those programs, meet with that student, mentor that student, et cetera. Um, and for girls in particular, students of color as well, um, we have to get them early and keep them in our sights the entire time because, you know, STEM has a fun way of becoming a white male able enterprise, right? So it is now, right? So how do we, how do we change the equation? How do we open up opportunities for rigor and problem solving, prototyping, et cetera? So, you know, getting those students, because uh, the girls in particular become disaffected quite early with STEM. And that's what the data shows us. And it's really scary and sad. The other thing that I would really encourage students to do and teachers to do would be to look at 3D parametric modeling programs. So your AutoCAD, CAD, Tinkercad, SolidWorks, um, they are they are in a lot of comprehensive high schools. So students who may not want to be engineers, they very often love to design. They want to be their own boss. They want to be, they want, they have a skill with creativity. They want, and that's a very real industrial use. Like you can go anywhere if you know SolidWorks, right? Yeah. You can go anywhere if you know AutoCAD. Uh, know. You can create your own. So good business and your own life with those programs. So those are very engaging uh, and students can just go off on a tangent with them. Um, and then if you're not familiar with Tinkercad, Tinkercad is a um, like a K through eight free program that uh, students and teachers can use to kind of mess around with CAD, which is computer aided design. I love that, thank you. Um, Kids are excited by the engaging guests, but when they are off the call, where does that support come from if families don't support? Where does the resilience for STEM come from within our current isolation? So uh, for teachers, it, you have to bring your A game. And I, I mean, I was always a, I was a high school science teacher. And so uh, I learned the hard way. Um, <laughs> Well, I always brought a lot of enthusiasm to my work and that, and I built relationships with kids. So if you bring enthusiasm about STEM 
and relationship building mindset to your Zoom life, I think that will certainly help. With the younger grades, all they really need is a little bit of enthusiasm and encouragement to engage in student inquiry, and you've got them, right? Mm -hmm. So I made the mistake, I became an elementary school principal with no elementary experience, and I'm bringing all this needed enthusiasm for high school. Well, the kids are already enthusiastic, right? At yeah. elementary, they're already amped to get to school, and then yeah. I bring my lunatic STEM you know, enthusiasm, and it was just too much. Right. Yeah. And I think the other thing I, you know, the other thing I keep thinking about is we have a lot of kids right now who have laptops or iPads at home because they have to in order to learn. And here's the crazy thing about a, a laptop. It moves. It's incredible. Like it doesn't need to be plugged in on the same yeah. desk. So I'm trying to think of if you're going to have kids like go outside and build something, yeah. Then I'm going to say, Deidre, it's your turn. Grab your, grab your laptop and we're going to follow you outside and we're going to follow you to the garden or we're yeah. going to follow you to the living room because you're going to show us your Rube Goldberg machine or, you know, take us on a turn. Yeah. Like these things move. They're, exactly. they're, it's incredible. You don't have to be stuck at your desk all the time inside that. And, and how would that even help if, if kids know that, hey, I get to show people the thing I created and yeah. it doesn't have to be this big, right? It can be right. huge. Absolutely. And, and I can take people to, to see my thing. Or maybe, maybe you just learned how to skateboard. And yeah. so you're going to go set your laptop out in the street. Don't do this. And you're going to like watch, watch kids yes. skateboard. Right. I, I think there's so many ways that we can really try and understand and reach into the passion of our kids. Yeah. Where sometimes we feel like we can't do that from a distance because we're stuck. Right. But I got well, news for you. Right. Unless you got a desktop computer, you're not stuck. Exactly. These things move and the yeah. battery will last long enough to go outside and watch a kid skateboard or they just learn how to do, play an instrument, you know, grab your instrument and play it for us. Like, you know, yeah. I think, and again, to your point, you, you know, we've got to find ways, I think as teachers uh, to keep kids motivated and to figure out what is their passion mm -hmm. uh, and continue to, to, to keep, you know, moving that way. Yeah, um, so, and I really, I love the idea of kids taking video of themselves or their products, their engineering, whatever, and showing it off and, you know, demonstrating to their classrooms how it works and why it works and what happened when it didn't work. Those yeah. are the conversations we want kids to be having with each other. It's certainly great for them it to happen between student and teacher, but yep. to have families having those conversations and student to student engineering, like, hey, did you think about this? using some of those DOK level three sentence stems that everybody's yeah. received 95 copies of, but you know, I don't know, nobody knows where they ended up, but having students ask questions of each other about design, about engineering prototyping, about the science and engineering practices, that's, that's STEM, that's yeah. it. And people are like, what the hell is STEM? That's it, yeah. that's what it is. And so, if we can look at this time as an opportunity to get students all like engaged in an alternate universe where they're engaging in inquiry, they're engaging in the science and engineering practices, in the mathematical practices, they're showing what they know and crafting evidence of learning that doesn't fit on a worksheet. Like maybe this is the time for that, right? Yeah, if it wasn't it. already. Yeah. And, and even Brent brings up, he's like, what about broadband or internet? Big issues around equitable access. Oh. Well, then maybe you don't do it live in a Zoom. Maybe it's take a picture on a phone. I mean, if anybody has a piece of, if anybody has a piece of technology, it's a cell phone. Absolutely. A cell phone comes with two 4K high definition cameras. That's right. A minimum of two. If you got the new iPhone, it comes with four cameras. So yeah. use them. Take yeah. a picture, make a video that's not online. You don't have to stream it, but yeah. kids can film a video with their cell phone or with mom or dad's cell phone. And then the next time they connect to a free Wi-Fi over at yeah. Walmart, you upload that video to Microsoft Teams or wherever, you know, Google Classroom, and the kid can yeah. for us to watch. And then I will play it in our next Zoom meeting because I have the bandwidth to do it. So well, I think there's ways to be thinking about it. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely no. not. It's not perfect. No. But there are ways, I think, for us to be thinking around what, what do these look like. Uh, well, I, we I like the question about what changes or new trends do you see? So I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. So... Uh, the new trends in STEM that I'm seeing that I think a lot of people are noticing too, um, I go, I call them the Palo Alto Project Schools, right? So if we go to Palo Alto Schools and we look at the tech giants of Palo Alto and their kids and what they're doing, they're offline, right? 
they are engaged in children's literature. They're engaged in math manipulation, uh, applied math at the earliest possible ages. They're engaged in computational thinking without devices, right? Okay. So they're going in the opposite direction for their kids because they want them to be able to think, solve problems, prototype, et cetera. So how, so what I think the future of STEM, we're gonna get, have almost like a, a renaissance of, you know, we're going to read those 100 books. We're going to um, make sure that, you know, people have experiences. Like I'm a STEM person because my parents taught me to be interested in STEM. My sixth birthday, I got an, a visible man model. Like I can look and see the organs and stuff like this. We're gonna teach kids to be interested in computational thinking and STEM because they are going to need it in the 21st century economy. So what is what do the trends look like? It looks like, you know, reading again. It looks like experiences, field trips, um, career connected learning with bringing those people in digitally or virtually from all over the world. Um, I mean, there's even people like, you know, Jane Goodall. Could we get yeah. Jane Goodall on the line? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, Jeff, I think you could. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you I know, got like, that kind of power, but. But yeah. I'm just saying, like, if, if there were yeah, webinars sure. put out there by people yeah. like her or, you know, these icons in STEM, what would that look like? Or even, you know, there's people within our grasp here in, in the Tri-Cities that have won the Nobel Prize. Right. We have a Nobel Prize sitting not 30 minutes from me down the road. Um, so how do we how do we it, it, how do we connect all of that greatness in any community with the kids in that community? And uh, those experiences, they're so important. Getting kids out of the house and on a hike, getting them to do know the local flora and fauna. Um, they will remember that a lot longer than they'll remember reading about hiking in a book or reading about plants and animals that are yeah. local in a, on a flyer. It's been one of my challenges these last couple of weeks with teachers is like, my challenge is to you is once a week, you have a guest come in and talk to your kids. There's, we all know how the technology works. And this is the crazy part. Zoom was not created because of the pandemic. It was already, it was already here. here. We didn't even know it was here. But now everybody knows how to use it. Yeah. So what if just once a week? And I, I love in the chat, Annabelle brought up and just said, I wish there was a way our kids are in Zoom meetings from eight to three. So maybe your Zoom meeting is where we're going to do this. And right. if you have your kids in a Zoom meeting for an hour, let's say your kids are in your hour of Zoom meeting. That doesn't mean that it has to be an hour of you delivering content. There's right. a lots of different ways to engage kids. If kids have a pack of toothpicks and a glue stick, you could have a 30 second build a house challenge. Oh yeah. And then what did, what worked? What didn't work? Show me your house. Yeah. Uh, you know, where they're, I mean, yes, the screen will still be on because they'll still be actively in Zoom, but they're going to be working with their hands. Absolutely. Or just taking a piece of paper and doing an airplane challenge, like yeah. build an airplane and we're going to measure how far, whose airplane flew the farthest and why do you think it yeah. flew the farthest or my airplane failed and why do you think like you can do this stuff over over a zoom um the kids don't have to just sit there and and stare at us the, the entire time and no. i think that's and, a that's something to be thinking about is how do we even in our zoom meetings how do we get kids off off the screen and working in their absolutely. hands absolutely well and my son like i just use him as an example my son's a straight a student and not necessarily because of what he's able to produce in terms of learning it's because he's compliant Right. Well, that's what we so, do in school. Right. And so he sits there for, you know, three hours a day today and four hours, you know, at, tomorrow. Um, and he listens and, you know, here's a kid who loves school, teacher's pet, great kid. You know, he's walking around the house saying he hates school. And, <laughs> and I, he's just sitting and getting right now. And maybe yeah. it will change, but I totally agree. Like get out the spaghetti. Let's build. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I don't care what all you have. What you, yeah. Whatever. Gonna, Grab something. <laughs> Grab something, toothpicks, Q-tips, um, yeah. spaghetti, pasta, cheap stuff, and let's build something together right now. And then you're going to talk about it. So get ready for that too. Um, yeah. Or, you know, do we have the ability to take those classroom libraries that have been beautifully curated and have kids have, you know, book boxes at home where they're reading novels, they're reading things like, you know, um, the book where the red fern grows and like okay we're all going to be reading where the red fern grows and we're going to develop a model of that ecosystem 
mm. using stuff from around the house, just from our reading. There's, a, there's no pictures in the book, but can we construct an ecosystem in line with fifth grade standards um, in real time and all together and build out a model of the ecosystem in that story? Um, you know, it's those kinds of things. Kids will remember that. They're not going, and they'll remember the story of, of you know, Dan and little Anne um, much more if they've done some sort of kinesthetic, hands-on, you know, representation of that story. Yeah, I love that. Well, Deidre, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, your work, your company, uh, where should they go? So um, at the end of the PowerPoint, I've got uh, all that. Can I put it in the chat? Uh, yeah, I shared it at the very beginning. I'll share it here again at the end for you. Yeah, so um, you guys, and I'll put it there for you. Um, you can always email me. So here's my email address. You can follow me on Twitter or contact me. Slide into the DMs right there. Feel free to do that. Um, and so, yeah, follow me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, STEM Core Consulting. Uh, or just email me. And I'm usually pretty good at getting back to folks. Um, I'm out in districts quite a bit uh, doing a lot of this hands-on work that we talked about today and family engagement stuff, which has been really fun. Um, and if you have special problems or products or things that you want help with, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm really into this work. This is my life's work. I love STEM. Um, and I'm interested in seeing and helping teachers get to the next spot with this. So call me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule as well to do this, uh, this webinar right. with us. It's also going to be released as a podcast. If you're a podcast listener, you can catch all our webinars as podcast too over at the Shifting Our Schools podcast. Uh, we do these pretty much every Thursday. Once in a while, it's a different day of the week, but we are back here next Thursday at four o'clock. Uh, be looking for that newsletter. We're going to be talking about learning without walls. And it's actually, uh, you'll love this. It, it's uh, one of our, one of the uh, uh, supporters here at Reimagine or one of our coaches at Reimagine YED. He is a high school social studies teacher who got his high school kids connected with um, a hospital in Uganda and they had to figure out how do you build a hospital, uh, plant a garden, how they had to ship them. They had to ship them all of the, all of the uh, equipment to build a garden. And they, the kids, high school kids had to figure out how to do all of this, like international shipping and, and yeah. get this, get this uh, hospital built uh, oh, in awesome. Uganda. It's it so cool. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking about that next week with Steve Murphy. So uh, join us. I'll definitely be there for that. that. Um, also for teachers interested in that kind of work, Engineers Without Borders is another great yeah. Great one. To reach out to they've got uh chapters all over the state of washington and all over the all over the world so check those guys out too awesome thanks everyone appreciate it till next time we'll see you on the network